Hi, YouTube. Hi, welcome to this week's Holy um, Club. It's another graduate Friday today. Uh, so we'll be having presentations by the Danny Peterson and Chen Yao Zheng, two PhD students. Uh, we'll start with the Lady Peterson's talk um, on the relationship between psychological well being, threat sensitivity, and political behavior. And with that, the floor is yours. Great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Delaney. I'm a PhD with the lab, and today I'll be presenting a bit about the project that I was hired on to, um, some important theoretical concepts in that landscape, and then a bit about my first year paper and where I've gone so far and, and where I'm headed with that. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here, and it's never lost on me how lucky I am to be a part of such a dynamic research group. Um, so thank you very much for having me. So I was hired on the Under Pressure Project, which is a project led by Barrett Bakker, um, and I, alongside Linda Baum, uh, were tasked with understanding the nuance inherent in the threat politics relationship. So specifically, we're looking at how societal threat perceptions are formed and how they influence political behavior, but also how people come to regulate themselves when they are faced with threat or threatening content. When I speak about threat, what I'm talking about is mostly socio-political threats. So threats such as climate change, immigration, um, COVID-19, but also imagine <laughs> threats such as conspiracy. And the emphasis here is really on how people perceive something and less so about the actual reality of whether or not that's immediately threatening to them. So within the literature, there is a pretty predominant concept called threat sensitivity. This is the idea that some people are physiologically predisposed to be threatened, uh, to be uh, in, aroused by threatening content. Um, and typically it's argued that this is an innate trait that's found in conservatives and right wing individuals, more so than left wing individuals. However, in recent years, this has actually been brought into contestation as the finding is not as robust as we once had thought. Um, threat sensitivity doesn't have a one uh, one way to measure it, and so people will use Likert scales. People also use uh, psychophysiological measures. So, really, with threat sensitivity, we're kind of come to the conclusion that we need to we need to really uh, go more in depth when it comes to understanding who is more threat sensitive, when, and under which context this uh, this comes about. And so an adjacent concept to that is one of visceral politics. Uh, this is by Tesqueras et al. And they highlight the potential relationship between one's physiological nervous states and one's political behavior. Um, and they do this specifically through the, the concept of allostatic load. So humans have evolved to healthily regulate stress. Um, and we can flexibly regulate a, quite a lot of stress, but when when the amount that comes in exceeds your bandwidth, you have what's referred as an allostatic load or a state of allostatic load. And this leads to a whole host of negative consequences for one system. So Tuscarius et al. really argue that we must look to how our visceral physiological states, such as allostatic load or chronic stress uh, within the individual, are implicated in political behavior. And so what I feel the current understanding of threat sensitivity is lacking uh, is potentially exactly this, uh, really looking into how the nervous system functions, because nervous system dysregulation is not something that's inherent to some individuals more than others, but it's something that we all experience from time to time, and it fluctuates. So I'm sure you all heard of fight, flight, and freeze response, which are common physiological nervous states. Most people assume that these are states that you, your nervous system inhabits when you um, are presented with a very extreme situation. However, when one is burdened with chronic stress or allostatic load, your nervous system tends in these directions. So, for example, um, these are states that we could actually go in and out of throughout the day. For example, if um, someone spills a cup of water and someone has an immediate, very angry and over disproportionate response to that spill, that could be argued someone's going into a fight response. Similarly, if somebody comes home from a long day of work and they end up staring at their screen for an hour, procrastinating making dinner, one could argue that someone going into more of a freeze response. And so these are um, ways that the dysregulated state actually shows up in our day-to-day -day life. And important to understand is that it actually leads to dysfunctional behavior, both in terms of how we take care of and manage ourselves, but also how we interact with other people. And so why is this relevant? Why does this matter? Um, essentially, if people are becoming more and more dysregulated, and that is also more or less synonymous with mental health, um, 
then it could be suggested that these states are impacting our political world. The U.S., but alongside many nations, have been um, undergoing what is referred to as mental health crises, and a question that this project addresses or attempts to address or begins to address is, <laughs> does nervous system dysregulation, allostatic load, or mental health uh, have political consequences? And two, can utilizing this concept of allostatic load help us better understand threat sensitivity? I would be remiss to not also briefly mention that the state and functioning of our nervous system is highly dependent upon our relationships to other people. So human beings are an inherently social species. If we feel like we lack safe, authentic connection in our lives, that has serious ramifications for our physiological states, our mental and emotional well-being. And ironically, not only has there been a mental health crisis, but there's also been what's referred to as a loneliness epidemic sweeping nations across the globe. And so this study will also um, take loneliness into account. So what do we do with all of these thoughts? Um, so we collected some data and we thought, let's come up with some proxies for this allostatic load uh, situation. So we took an anxiety and depression inventory, a general health inventory, which is one that we actually took from various surveys. So this is one we created ourselves and the ERQ-10, which is an emotional regulation questionnaire that looks at two forms of regulation. Uh, the first is suppression, which is a maladaptive response. And the second is reappraisal, which would be an adaptive way to cope with intense emotions. And we also include loneliness here with the de Jong garville Loneliness Scale, which is a widely used measure for loneliness. Some examples of the items you can see here. However, when we got to this point, we realized that this might not be the whole story. And it could be that there's allostatic load or mental health issues specific to the political domain that we fail to capture when we rely solely on general health measures. And so in line with the visceral politics idea as well, that this political domain is actually having uh, an impact on physiologic states, we decided to adapt our proxies for allostatic load to be solely political. So for example, for political anxiety, the question includes about politics at the end. Uh, the political health measure that we use is one that's actually already been created and validated. And the ERQ, um, we changed to be about political emotions instead. So I'll just give you a few moments to take a look at these examples. Oh, important to mention is that we do not uh, translate loneliness into a political component simply because the language did not really fit the items that we had available. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we could really compare these properly. So we haven't gotten too far with the analysis. Um, where we are now is looking at the factor structure of the items that I just showed you. So we pre-registered two steps so far. The first is an exploratory um, phase of the factor structure, and the second is to confirm that factor structure. So this was a Dutch sample uh, we collected about a couple months ago, and the N overall is around 2000. And what we did was we took 500 of those participants and we ran some exploratory graded response models to determine the factor structure of the general health and political health items separately. And then what we did was we pre-registered our assumptions uh, for the conformatory phase, and we took 500 separate, uh, a separate sample within this uh, to then test our confirmatory analysis. Uh, we use graded response models here because of the polychoric nature of our data, but also the non-normal distribution of some of the variables. So what we found is a very similar setup between general and political health items. The first factor uh, basically refers to a general mental and physical health component that I label for now as dysregulation, um, and then to uh, emotion regulation techniques as uh, suppression and reappraisal. Very interestingly is that they map similar factors, but also that in both the exploratory and confirmatory phase, the political health scales demonstrated a stronger model and item fit, suggesting that we are honing in on something specific here. Um, so some next steps would be to first run exploratory correlations between our independent variables and political outcome variables, and then to pre-register expectations and run confirmatory analyses. So I'm going to talk you through briefly uh, what outcome variables we have. 
The first is threat perceptions. So we ask the question, how threatened do you feel by the following on a scale of one to seven? So here's a list of the threats that we included. I wanted to make sure we had kind of a wide range of threat type. So the first two, uh, woke culture and populism, okay. would be the cultural war kind of component to threats. We have some classic immigration and climate change issues. We also have personal health issues and interpersonal issues to try to get a look at perhaps if uh, personal threat is implicated in these relationships alongside AI, GMOs, housing crisis, economic safety, and misinformation. Ideally with this, I want to try to take an overall threat sensitivity index, so maybe take the mean of people's responses to these to see if we can get at um, some, some conceptualization of threat sensitivity, um, but I would also like to look at them individually as well. We're also going to look at conspiracy belief, um, so we're using the conspiracy questionnaire inventory, which is four measures um, already validated. We're going to look at affective polarization, news avoidance, and uh, populism or right-wing populism as well. So that is essentially it. That's where we've come so far. And uh, I understand that this was maybe a lot of information, so I'm happy to provide any clarification that's needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, to me, it was not entirely clear how do you ask. Uh, so do you ask how threatened are you or how threatened or how threatening are these and how do you feel OK? Mm -hmm. So it's. Um, OK, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's... yeah, so I had a question about this as well. I well, first of all, I think this is super cool and very interesting. So thanks. Um, OK, because we're on this slide already. I was wondering in, with regards to some of these items, like. I mean, yeah, I was, I, I was thinking about like personal health issues and interpersonal issues. I mean, if you're asking, I, I understand that you want to ask like how you're trying to get at the threat, threat sensitivity of the individual person. But I wonder for those ones, like if like, for example, I could say, yes, if I had personal health issues, I would be threatened. But if I am currently not having any personal health issues, then, mm -hmm. you know, I would score that low. But in general, mm -hmm. I would feel yeah. threatened by it. Mm -hmm. And the same with, like, divorce and breakup into personal issues. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, maybe, I'm not really sure. Yeah, no, that's a really fair point. How to think, that maybe you could think about putting it as a more like, um, if this was to be, which yeah, no, that's a really good point moving forward. Um, I really hadn't considered that. So. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, I had another question. Okay, I had like two more, sorry. Um, first of all, I was wondering about these general health items that you had. Um, I thought, like, I really liked the idea of it, but I didn't really understand the political ones. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When I looked at these ones, they sort of suggested me like very stress related sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then the political ones, I didn't really get the connection so much. OK, yeah. So it's um, so the political health scale is one that's already been validated in use. So we took that and we tried to create a more or less adjacent general health. So for each item, I don't know if I match them up with the examples I gave, uh, but for each item, there is one that's supposed to be as similar as possible. Uh, right. OK, yeah. Um, yeah, that makes that makes more sense. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah. and sorry. Last thing is, I was curious when you did this data collection mm -hmm. of the pilot data because um, I can imagine, depending when it was, if it was recently, given elections and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, yeah. yeah, we did this in December, about mid December. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Delaney. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, I obviously find this super interesting as well, fascinating. And I'm always uh, still a bit uh, struggling with the relationship of the emotion regulation and emotions. Like, when does what mm, happen? Yeah. What state? Yeah. Because I was wondering if you assume that people have this allostatic load, mm -hmm. then I wonder is this kind of in contrast with the items? Because the items on emotion regulation, mm -hmm. especially the reappraisal one, assumes that you go in with a calm state and with a non-stress state because it says it helps mm -hmm. me stay calm. Um, 
Yeah, but then if you are, I so, but then you already have negative emotions from this early study. Yeah, oh, but then you're just regulating the new threat, or can you can you elaborate? Yeah, no, that's a very good point, and uh, yeah, it's it's a good one. So, um, I guess yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think so. The way that you could look at it is so. For example, if people score highly on the one dimension of dysregulation, and then these are two separate dimensions. So. We could then say, OK, people who score highly on this, maybe we suspect that it will correlate with suppression because that's a maladaptive coping mechanism. But then we could say they would correlate uh, not so much with reappraisal. So I, you are correct that this is a different dimension in and of itself. Yeah. And I wasn't clear about that. Yeah, I'm far, um, I feel very anxious about politics. Mm -hmm. But then I read the item that when I'm faced with a stressful political situation, I think about it in a way that it helps me stay calm. I would think, but I just told you that I wasn't calm in the first place because I feel constantly anxious about politics. So it's kind of like, is this? It, I just wonder, does this new event mm -hmm. add something else on top to this? Audience? I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just so, so calm, yeah. these were kind of given, uh, so this is one, kind of inventory. This is a second and this is a third. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was just randomized when it comes to the order at which they got these items. So maybe that helps a bit, but I do I do get your point. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. This was really uh, clear and now I, I'm really enthusiastic about how the project will develop. So this is a, a great, great start. I have just um, a question, and I don't know this whether this is intentional or this is because of the literature that you are mm -hmm. referring to about how you are talking about emotional responses. So my first question is then, what are emotions for? What are they actually, right? So I think that somewhere on the floors mm -hmm. here, there is actually like uh, someone uh, trying to define uh, emotions is basically <laughs> doomed <laughs> what an emotion is. Mm -hmm. But if emotions are for the regulation of the social interactions, I am not sure why you are making this normative statement mm -hmm. about, you know, political or uh, emotional suppression is, is a bad thing, oh, okay. right? It is yeah. kind of assumed in your narrative mm -hmm. that this is something wrong. But actually, you know, if you are interacting, I don't know, within your in-group or mm -hmm. with an out-group, you might have a very valid and environmentally adaptive response mm -hmm. yeah. when you are suppressing. Um, so maybe it is, so you, you can answer this, but what I think about is maybe you are just talking about the mismatches that are, you know, uh, between the environment that we evolved in and where the emotions mm -hmm. potentially evolved and nowadays environment of politics, right? And maybe then these responses are mismatched somehow. But I'm not sure about this kind of normative, uh, well, this is maladaptive. Right? Yeah, Always. yeah. so I'm, I'm just following um, the, the literature that suggests. So with the ERQ, the way they frame it is that this is a maladaptive and this is an adaptive, right? So I'm just kind of reiterating that. But on, on deeper thought, I think that is a really good point and I would have to consider that more deeply. Um, but yeah, that's the short answer. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. We can continue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, first of all, I really like your know, project. It's, uh, it's really interesting to me. Um, I have several questions. First, on the concept of understanding loads, you say, well, we all are all sensitive to it, right? We all, well, once in a while, can experience stress, right? But I was wondering, aren't there like individual differences in this in this bandwidth? Because I think some people, just by nature, due to the personality, mm -hmm. So they're more sensitive to stress than others, so we we don't have the same bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I was wondering, are you going to consider these individual uh, differences? Mm -hmm. Because if so, that would mean that one group, like like the group that's really uh, yeah sensitive to stress, but they can more easily be activated yeah. by things like political messages. So yeah. my first question: Are you going to identify uh, these groups? Then I was also wondering your allostatic load, right? That you ex experience mm -hmm. political anxiety. Can be due to different reasons, right? You can you can be extremely worried about the economy, mm -hmm. or you mm -hmm. just uh, think Trump is a danger, right, to uh, mm -hmm. to democracy. So are you going to consider the different sources uh, of uh, um, of allostatic loads, and they may have uh, heterogeneous effects, right? Mm -hmm. Then I was wondering uh, the dependent variable. Well, that was not totally clear, but it, I think it's political behavior, right? So it would be interesting. Mm -hmm, yeah, so we have a few. Uh, so the first question was, how am I going to deal with the sensitive group? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So the idea is that this is a very broad kind of understanding of dysregulation. And um, some people do have more sensitive states, and that would probably be attributed to past experiences, right? So for example, if you've experienced a lot of interpersonal trauma or maybe attachment issues growing up, your nervous state might be more hypersensitive. Um, that's not some that's not a nuance that I'm currently picking up, but I think it's a very important component. Um, so what this is doing is just taking a baseline of can we get a can we get a look at if certain people are if if this dysregulation correlates with these political outcomes? Um, moving forward, I would want to address these complexities. Yeah, or is this to interact with a trait like big fat neuroticism? Yeah. yeah, I think um, personality is not. No, we did capture that actually. So we can correlate that and, and see. Yeah. Yeah, and then I have an additional question. Of course, it's, uh, yeah, the, the, well, I really like to frame like there's a health crisis in the US and it's going to affect people's behavior. Mm. So I really like the angle. Mm -hmm. And still, of course, could that put in these spurious uh, correlation? Just think of any other search variables mm -hmm. that both uh, increase yeah. the anesthetic load. And uh, yeah, and influence political behavior. Yeah, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is the internet um, mm -hmm. and social media. Mm -hmm. uh, we're exposed to so much information and traumatic information at a rate that I just don't think we're equipped to handle. So I think that would be one. But what was your third question? If I um, yeah, the, yeah. I also had a question like the yeah, aesthetic load it can mm -hmm. be overloaded due to different reasons, right? So, yes. Yeah. But you're going to mm -hmm. consider that like uh, uh, yeah. So. Basically, what I showed you, um, I guess we could look at the threats and see if some people okay. correlate more highly with certain political uh, events. But this is what we've got as of now. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. And then my final question is, uh, of course, I really liked it that you showed the urgency of your research, right? The U.S. health uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. But then just playing devil's advocate, I was wondering, mm -hmm. would it be different if you could run your research during, for instance, the Bush uh, junior uh, administration? Oh, yeah. No, I, I think that's a really good point. And I um, I wonder as well, I think that the idea, at least the narrative in the media and also even with some of the political science literature now is that the political domain is shifting and there are um, more stressors than we once dealt with. But that could also be just due to exposure to those stressors right via the Internet. Um, so, yeah, it's a question that's up for debate. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, thanks, Lainey, for this mm -hmm. talk. It was really cool to see uh, something about the PhD research now. And I was just wondering, and hopefully I didn't miss it, but mm -hmm. could you tell us something about the expectations that you Yeah, yeah to certainly. Start? Um, and are there about differences to the non-political domain? Mm -hmm. and yeah. So we didn't uh, we didn't make any uh, assumptions yet. We haven't run the correlations, so I haven't pre-registered any expectations. But I do have them here in case someone asks this. Um, so. Okay. First and foremost, I think dysregulation is going to correlate with threat sensitivity. That's the main kind of chunk. But I think it will be stronger for the political health items. And I think that it will be stronger when the threat aligns with one's political identity. So, for example, um, if I'm politically dysregulated and I'm a Republican, I'm going to be more sensitive to right wing threats. Kind of a self-explanatory. And I also think dysregulation correlates with what I'm labeling dysfunctional political behavior, it's not a value judgment. It's just a word that I've used to describe um, these different trends. <laughs> coming up. Very not judgmental. <laughs> so for, so um, it would be stronger for political dysregulation again uh, in some examples here. So I'm predicting, say, loneliness, right? Dysregulation through loneliness, conspiracy belief, um, political dysregulation, affective polarization. So this is the, the broad idea that I have now. Yeah, so um, it, it's already a useful tool in itself to be able to get closer and closer to politics conceptually. Mm -hmm, yeah. But I was wondering, since like I, I'm not sure if you've done correlations between no, we two instruments. Yeah, you might expect that the correlations oh. are high, right? So um, we, yeah, we can't actually correlate between the two political and general because we took. So as we ran the survey, we actually uh, gave half of those political items to one half, and then the other half to the other because that wording was so similar. I should have mentioned that. Yeah. And, but you would expect that the correlations might be very high, um, mm -hmm. but not high to the point that it's the same thing. Um, yeah. And maybe if you subtract one by the other, you get the distance between both. And let's say that if for, for one person, the distance is very little, that might just mean that they're anxious about everything, for example. Mm -hmm. But if the distance is very big, maybe that means that they're really not, not very interested in politics and it's just 
overwhelms mm -hmm. them. So maybe that could be a way of you approaching a specific part of the demographic mm -hmm. that really doesn't like politics for some particular reason. Is this something you're interested in isolating? Yeah, absolutely. I just wonder if we could do it with the current way the data was was set up. Um, right now, we can at least see the impact of these two general and political measures on the political outcome variables. But yeah, I do like that idea for sure. So do I understand why that you didn't measure any personality? We did actually. We did. Yeah. So what I find or what I found so far is that with the uh, red sensitivity, there is two traits that are strongly correlated: is neuroticism and disagreeableness, or like emotional stability. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, neuroticism, as far as I found in the data, is strongly related to authoritarianism, as well as to maladaptive. Well, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. I can say. Um, All right. Uh, negative this will be appraisal, positively to emotional avoidance and to um, uh, emotional suppression. Mm -hmm. uh, but also that neuroticism or like vulnerability mm -hmm. is more related to interpersonal threat. Yeah. Whereas disagreeableness is mm -hmm. more related to achievement related threat. Uh, so do you differentiate between interpersonal threat and non-interpersonal threat? Uh, not necessarily, not in this. Uh... I don't believe so. Um, the personality is a very interesting component that I actually have just kind of relegated to not addressing, which is interesting. Um, but I think it's definitely something I'll, I'll look at the correlations as well. Um, when it comes to personality, when you mentioned neuroticism and agreeableness, one could also expect then that this dysregulation would correlate highly. But personality is kind of a way that we, uh, these broad conceptualizations to understand people and the patterns that they have. And when we talk about mental health and the nervous system, this is actually like a different way of understanding people's behavior. So I would be interested to in see how they correlate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I thought you indicated that. I, I did, I changed my mind. Sorry, that's totally fine. We'll just go. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. It was super interesting. I come from a different field. Uh, mm -hmm. So I. Uh, there was a statement in the beginning that caught my attention that was like the relationship between mental mental health and how it can destroy democracy. Um, so I, for me, it was a bit ambiguous because when I think of mental health, I have like in on one hand like a, a anxiety and on, on the other hand I have a depression, for example. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the um, allostatic load could be manifested differently in, in anxiety yes. and depression. Yeah. So if I think of depression and anxiety, I feel that um, I might feel this uh, hopelessness mm -hmm. and instead of yeah. feeling threatened by any kind of uh, environmental issues, I'm going to reject any kind of threat and I'm going to uh, yeah, feel that I don't want to participate in this. I'm not going to mm -hmm. value them as something that are dangerous. So first, if these depressive symptoms are taken into account because if you only take into account what you feel as threatening, maybe those things that you don't consider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I respond? Are yes, you, yes, yes. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good point and I'm glad you brought it up. So we did take the anxiety and depression inventory, which technically is supposed to um, load onto two different factors. So then we would be able to see, OK, anxiety, the hyper aroused state versus depression, the hypo aroused. And that was the idea. They actually loaded onto one. And um, so the way I'm seeing this is this is a very first step and a general broad way to understand dysregulation. Um, but it is true that there's so much more nuance to these states, even with um, fight, flight, freeze. Right. That could implicate us in different political behavior as well. So, yeah, I fully understand that. And on the like on the other side of the sentence, like we have the mental health. But we also have like the how uh, democracy can be like uh, how can it be detrimental? And I was thinking, do you expect that because of this allostatic load, there is going to be like a massive polarized um, votation or the rejection of votes? Yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. I think, like you're saying, is it will manifest differently depending on the context. So something that I'm interested in pursuing uh, is looking at how identity is implicated in this. And I, I there was a study that showed that depression. So there are studies that show loneliness and depression lead to abstaining from politics, which can be true. But there's also times when those nervous states can be manipulated and then activate different political behavior. So another study um, that I've been working on is with loneliness and voting for populist parties. 
And so there's an example where the dysregulation might have been manipulated in some way and spoken to that individual in some way that led them to act in particular ways. Um, so there's a lot of nuance to this, but I would like to get more into it. Okay, I think we'll have to wrap it up here because of course I have uh, Chanel coming up. Delaney, thanks again for super sure. interesting Thank you. Presentation. Um, so, yeah, we talk about this power for uh, individual sharing decisions. However, there were uh, past studies showing that these information sharing decisions are often biased. <laughs> First, they are biased towards individual level, which is evidenced in the pro attitudinal sharing. For example, uh, in this study by Shin and Thorson, they so show that basically when people are spread fact checking messages, they tend to share messages that cheerlead their own political candidates and attacking the opponent. So there's evidence that people indeed incline to share messages that are aligning with their previous uh, political attitude rather than going against their previous attitude. And online political information sharing is also biased towards group level, um, as evidenced by people's inclination to in interact more with their political in-group but in out group. Um, in this study by Mosley et al, for example, they show that people are three times more likely to follow back a Twitter profile if it displays um, in, in political in party cues rather than political out party cues. And subsequently, uh, with this building of social ties, people are more um, inclining to engage with conversation and information exchange, as well as information sharing with their political in group. So we have this bunch of past studies showing that there exists this uh, biased political information sharing behavior, but why is that the case? And to answer this question, we need to go back to the very beginning of the story, which is why people share at all. And value-based model of information sharing uh, makes a, a powerful theoretical account for why people share things um, at all. And according to this theory, um, we, our sharing decision is very much value-based. So we assign subjective values to the aspects of our sharing action. And then we evaluate the pros and cons. And then we arrive at a action that maximizes these outcomes. And this process, we consider, for example, um, the self-relevance and the social relevance, which are the two central mechanisms. On the level of self-relevance, uh, to put it simply, our self-concept matter and also our self-consistency matter. Um, so, for example, one past study by Tamir and Michelle showed that when people are disclosing themselves, when they're expressing their self-concept, making self-referential expressions, it's int intrinsically and psychologically rewarding. And there were also past studies showing that people tend to avoid cognitive dissonance, which is often a result of viewing, processing, and handling counteracting information because it re requires more cognitive effort um, to, to integrate them into the belief system. And also it, um, it is more likely to raise cognitive dissonance in this case. And uh, regarding social relevance, audience also matter. And um, specifically, people tend to employ what is called audience tuning, when they're sharing information, so basically they change what they're sharing and they change what uh, the way they're sharing, um, considering about the imagined audience. So, for example, if I'm going to share with my friends or if I'm going to share a piece of information with my family, it's going to pro probably be a different outcome. And also, if I'm facing an audience that are super um, socially punishing, so they're going to punish me or exclude me based on my sharing action, then my sharing decision would probably also change. So applying this theory, it might explain why people share in such a biased way, because in the individual level, they're biased towards sharing messages that are pro attitudinal because they're less, um, they require less cognitive effort, and then they help people to maintain their cognitive consistency. And on a social level audience, they um, value the in-group audience over the all-group audience, and also they value especially this uh, positive feedback rather than punishing feedbacks from this audience. But what is lacking in this picture is the interplay between these two levels. So for example, let's imagine a situation where I have this message that personally I agree with, but my audience potentially doesn't agree with that, then should I share it or not? And also if I'm facing this audience that is going to be super punishing towards whatever dissenting voices, then should I share this message that they potentially wouldn't agree? And to capture this dynamics, we design our experiment. And here is our research question. How are biased sharing decisions driven by individual level characteristics of the would-be sharer and group level char characteristics of the sharing audience, both independently and collectively? On the individual level, we look at people's previous uh, political attitudes. And on the audience level, we look at the audience political attitude and also whether they're sharing with a socially punitive or socially tolerant group. And this is the general setup of our design. 
we recruited 402 Dutch citizens through the company Dynata, and then we administrate this Quadric survey to them, which includes a social media sharing task um, that I would explain in more details in the following slide. But basically, the tasks manipulate uh, message political attitudes, so what kind of messages people are going to read. That's going to be either left or right. And then we also manipulate um, the group they're going to interact with, whether they're politically left or right, and whether they're socially punitive or socially tolerant. And then we add individual political attitude as a covariate, uh, and that would allow us to capture, for example, whether people are sharing more messages that are pro attitudinal and whether people are inclined to in interact with their in-group, etc. Uh, so yeah, now we move to the specific design of the social media sharing task. Basically, before the task starts, we ask them two survey questions. The first one would measure their individual political attitude, which is a scale from zero to 10. And there's going to be a mean center to, uh, during analysis, with the zero representing left and 10 representing right. And then we ask them a second survey question asking about their preferred political party among three Dutch political parties ranging from left and right. And we collect this question basically because we want to use it as a stimuli manipulation. Um, that I'm going to talk about in a later stage. And then people start the social media sharing task. They first encounter a screen, tell them they're going to be randomly paired with a group. Um, but of course, it's not random because we control the pairing. And then uh, we tell them that they're paired with this randomly selected group. That group also did a same question of the preferred political party as they do. And then we show them the full result of the group and we man manipulate this result to be either left or right oriented based on the majority preference of the political party. In this case, it's going to be a left group. And next, people will see this chat history sample, which we tell them are all adapted by a real conversation. And in this conversation, we match it to the political attitude as shown in the poor results, and we also make the, the chat to convey either a punitive or a tolerant group norm. This is basically through how people uh, in the group chat treat dissenting voices. If it's in an angry and in civil way, it's considered a punitive group and vice versa for the tolerant group. And after reading, we ask people to read various political messages from left to right. Um, they read two left and two right messages in each block specifically, and then they rate how much they're going to how likely they're going to share this message to the specific group. And after the end of the block, they also have this manipulation check question in which they rate how much they perceive the group as left or right and how much they perceive the group as tolerant or punitive. And the whole process, the whole block process will repeat for four times in which people will interact with a left punitive group, a left tolerant group, a right punitive group and a right tolerant groups in random order. So now we come to the results section. First is the manipulation check. We found that indeed uh, the manipulations are successful because people indeed perceive the left group to be more left, the right group to be more right, and the tolerant group to be more tolerant, the punitive group to be more punitive. And all of these uh, two differences are statistically significant. We have the message political attitude pre-tested in another study. But that's why we don't include it here in this study. And then moving to the main findings, we find that indeed people display this uh, pro attitudinal sharing um, inclination because they tend to share messages concurrent to their personal belief. But as shown in the graph, people on the left spectrum tend to share more messages that are left than messages that are right, and vice versa for people on the right spectrum. There is also this in-group sharing bias where people incline to interact with the political in-group. So, uh, so people on the left spectrum, they tend to interrupt interact more with the left group and less with the right group and vice versa for people in the right spectrum. Um, what is noticeable is that these two effects are independent from each other. So basically it means that whatever group people interact with, they tend to share more messages that are pro attitudinal and whatever messages they're sharing, they're more inclined to interact with in group. And uh, one detrimental consequence of it is if people continue to share primarily with their in-group and also primarily messages that are pro-attitudinal, then even if we're not actively seeking for pro-attitudinal information, we're likely to be always exposed to messages of this kind. And that would be um, detrimental to the development of a democratic and, and diverse online conversational environment. And we also find this interaction effect from the generic group, no group norm. Specifically, a tolerant group norm will help to lessen the bias of, of pro attitudinal sharing by uh, shifting the slope a little bit. However, although we find this to be significant as an interaction term, 
the post hoc tests are nonetheless non significant. And one reason we can uh, we try to explain with is with the manipulation, because as you can see, the manipulation of the general group norm isn't as salient as the political attitude. Specifically, you see that the difference are a lot smaller, and also they kind of cluster toward the central point, which is the 50% rating. So, yeah, and then we speculate that would be a reason why um, the effect we found here is relatively weak. And as a conclusion, we find this press level factors driving bias information sharing, specifically the pro attitudinal sharing effect and the in-group sharing effect. And we, will, we also find this mitigating effect from the tolerant group norm on pro attitudinal sharing, which would have translational implication because if this, this civility and tolerance indeed can have this de-bias or even depolarized effect, then it's going to be relevant for the development of uh, future translation applications. And regarding the future steps, first, we um, our study is exploratory by nature, and we would need uh, confirmatory data to replicate these findings and also to re-detect findings that are relatively weak in the present data set. And also, we would aim to improve the manipulation, specifically the manipulation of general group norm, and to make it more salient. As all of um, that's also one of the discussion points that I would like to bring about in QA session. But for now, Thanks for listening, and also a big thank you for my supervision team. And the funding of the project comes from the RPA organization. I have two. Yeah. One is like a real question. One is a I missed it question. But, uh, I think this is really cool, right? So I I I also work on polarization and the background science so this is kind of and something that i really like and i think this is very interesting stuff um the clarification question i i couldn't read it from here but i was really interested what the manipulation was in that mm -hmm. chat like what are they what yeah. are they showing what are they talking about yeah to do this And I'm showing here the English uh, version of it. That's the left linear tolerant, right linear tolerant, left linear punitive, right linear punitive. That's one of the examples that people would encounter. But um, I think you probably can notice uh, the punitive language are not that punitive. In that. Okay, cool. Thanks for clarifying. Um, the the other question that I had was. Uh, Maybe I also miss this, but I like we know that counter attitude no information gets shared uh, by people, right? And sure, it may not be a fun what attitude people say, but it's often shared with like some form of disclaimer, yeah. right? Or like discounting that, whatever, or saying, you know, what a crock of swear word in here. Um, I was wondering if you're gonna look at that too, because I think that would be very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what you say is exactly what we were discussing right now. And then there was this super interesting article. This one says, Out group animosity drives engagement on social media. It basically shows that people like to show in group favoritism, but also out group hatred. So they derogating uh, messages that are triumphing the out group. They basically say, I don't agree with it, and this is bullshit. Um, indeed, we don't have it here right now in our, uh, our data set. We indeed included one question asking whether you're going to share this message um, showing agreement or disagreement. Um, but first, we haven't got a few, full analysis of this question yet. And second, I think this question itself might not be super accurate in capture whether people are going to share in a derogative way because they might share and say, I just disagree with part of the statement, not necessarily just I want to show in the derogative way. But I think, um, yeah, so it's something that we still need to figure out. But I think it's definitely matter as audience tuning also implies that not just what we are, what people are sharing matters, but also how they share matters. Right, but see, so I was thinking one way, sorry, one way that could be, and I don't know if there's space for this in the grand scheme of things, but it could be quite simple to do. Because you could be like, okay, first of all, would you, would you ever share this, yay or nay? And then second of all, imagine you're going to share it. Would you share it with text? Here's a text box, what would you share? And then you also have kind of like an open field of exactly how people would share that. And that would maybe be very interesting to yeah. look at too. 
we thought about this initially as well, but yeah. then we didn't do it because of the length of the questionnaire. As, yeah. uh, this is the exploratory one, so we also have a bunch of other factors that I didn't talk about, okay. like their individual scales. So that already made the questionnaire into 40 minutes, um, almost 40 minutes for some of the participants, and then 30 minutes for most of the participants. And that's why we didn't add a textbook uh, box. But if you're going to do replication with only this test, then I think it might be a way out. Yeah, that would be very cool. I, I think that that would be very interesting data as well, like uh, what people would actually say to. So. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, you mentioned a few times that the study was exploratory, but the theory you showed in the beginning sort of gave some relatively clear expectations for the results, right? And you also mentioned, okay, then this is sort of in line with the theory. So then I was wondering why you sort of, I mean, you probably included some other questionnaires as well, but why you still sort of made it an exploratory study. Yeah, so the main reason I call it exploratory study is basically it's not pre-registered. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but we do have all of this theoretical expectation and we have a draft of the hypothesis, but it's not in a pre-registered format. Okay, no. uh, yeah, but then for the confirmatory data analysis, we would for sure have this pre-registered plan and then do all of the steps. Yeah. I wouldn't call it exploratory. Yeah, I just really think the yeah. philosophical thing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, you try to like understand how uh, people react to in-group and out-group uh, messages. I was wondering if you take into account also the, the quality of the in-group or out-group uh, message. So, for example, if in the chat is written something like, uh, something, yeah, I don't like Donald Trump because he's ugly, mm -hmm. uh, that would be like a very low quality against Donald Trump, or it could be like, oh, I hate Donald Trump because he did this, this, this and that. So yeah. I don't know if the, the quality of the message could influence how in-group or out-group uh, participants interact. Um, okay, so just one question following uh, your question. So you mean message quality of the message you're going to share? Uh, Is it badly written or something like that? So if if I understood correctly, maybe you know, in the chat, the, the, the participant reads, there's information yeah. right, about in-group or out-group information. So I assume that in this chat, you can read something like, oh, uh, climate change is good or climate change is bad because. Yeah, OK, so you mean the chat history, yeah. not the message they share? No, this one. OK, yes, yeah, so the left side one. Yeah, we talk about how to make this manipulation. And one thing we come up with is not to mention any specific issue in this chat. Um, so for example, you say climate change or refugee, we don't mention any of the specific topics in this um, chat because um, let's imagine you have this group who's specifically like suppose you are, for example, left leaning, and then you have this right group, right group in general, and you have this right group specifically against an immigration issue. And I think if you're going to share an immigration message, then this group who's already showing you a very clear attitude towards this specific issue wouldn't be valued, like wouldn't be worth a share at all because they're going to not agree with you anyway. But the other group that is just like more general, they're probably going to have a conversation with you because they're not specifically showing this disagreement of this specific issue, but they're just not on the same political spectrum as you do. And I don't know if you get what I mean, but that's why we initially made a decision to not mention any specific issue in the chat. And then in terms of the quality of the, the conversation, we try to, of course, control it um, as the same quality and also not to use very ridiculous or silly words such as I don't like Donald Trump because he's ugly, something like that. Um, but yeah, we don't have a measure that people to for people to perceive like the, the quality of the conversation. And I think even if we include a measure, like how do you think of the quality, it's going to be biased by the in-group and out-group as well. So um, honestly, I don't have a good solution on whether we can evaluate the quality based on people's perception. But uh, indeed, we're trying to control them to make them as the same quality, just different by. Um, could you tell us something about the effect sizes you found? Because if I uh, remember the graph correctly, the the personal alignment is a much much stronger predictor. Yeah, so the unstandard. Yeah. And could you speculate about these differences? So. Yeah, the unstandard data uh, estimate was printed here, but I wasn't able to derive the R partial R squared of the 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 regression, which is still work in progress. 
But yeah, it is indeed the the, the case that the the proagonal sharing has like a larger gap than the intergroup sharing, but I haven't had time to look into it yet. Okay. Um, and the other reason I think is because maybe the group effect in this case is just relatively weaker because I have this study um, when I'm looking at why some of the group effect are absent or weak. I've read this study recommended by one of my supervisors basically saying that when there is a lack of social presence, the group's effect is just going to be smaller for people. For example, if you imagine that you're going to talk with someone, but you don't get any feedback, you don't see how people react to you, and then it's just this imagined chat, then usually people are just like less, less concerned with the, with the group norm. And I think what, maybe that's a reason to explain why the group effect is a lot smaller. But um, that's just my pre preliminary suggestion. Right. Thanks. Um, so I have one small follow up to that. Um, so you are looking at a very specific operationalization of in group and out group, right? It's really just being either left or right on the political yeah. spectrum. And from my own study, this is coming close to like political identity, let's say. And I found that actually what was a better predictor in manipulation was actually a conflict between you and the other group. So not necessarily how you identify, whether you identify as left or right. Uh, this was a study about Russia versus the EU, but how big conflict uh, gap you see between the, the two groups, right, between you and them. So that was that might be something to also think about in the future design. And then I have, um, I still don't really get how you go um, about this development of the chat in terms of punitiveness or tolerance. So I see also here actually a manipulation of, with, again, from the previous studies, I would call like a deliberative styles. So you can have people who have strong deliberative norms, right? And they would not use words such as that's ridiculous, right? They would not say that. And people who, who do. So did you actually derive that manipulation from some some studies or some theories of you know, speech acts, uh, or this is just a hunch that this is about punitiveness or tolerance, because again, I don't know which one it is. And then normatively, is it good for democracy if we do never, if we always are tolerant towards some extreme views, for example, mm. right? Because you made that statement, well, it's not good for democracy when we are not tolerant, but maybe sometimes we should not tolerate something. Right, so that's uh, three three small points, but also super exciting studies. So sorry, I did not uh, elaborate, but <laughs> save it for the question. Yeah, I have um, <clears throat> two minor questions. A very nice study. Uh, my uh, first question is. Uh, it's about the ecological validity of your study, because if I correctly understand it, uh, in the experiments, you are you are engaging with strangers. Of course, you see their conversation, but these people are strangers to you. So I was wondering if we translate your findings to the real world. So I guess you have something to say about how people will communicate on X, on X right? Or to go with previous Twitter. But does it also travel to how I would com uh, communicate with my friends, for instance, if I know if I have dissenting opinion, I, well, I already built trust with my friends, right? So we have to trust to disagree. So that's just a yeah, question to, uh, yeah, to reflect on yeah, to the settings in real life to which your findings extend. That's my first question. My second question is a follow-up question on the discussion. Uh, you said the group chat, it should not be literally about climate uh, change. It should not be literally about immigration, but, but about left and right. And uh, yeah, I'm still not fully sure about it because now there's still some sort of ambiguity, right? So but maybe also left wing people can be skeptical of climate change. So uh, yeah, maybe I don't know whether you already have it on the review, but maybe people could be critical in this regard. Also, if you know, well, these people are really talking about climate change, then you really measure whether they chicken out or whether they really confront the group on that particular issue. And now there's a source of ambiguity. Also, for instance, there are also left-wing parties which are not necessarily extremely multiculturalist. So these are my uh, my two questions, but very nice. Okay, um, the first question, can you repeat it again? Because I already got it. Uh, yeah, just an ecological validity. And, yeah. Yeah, and just an open question to which settings in the real life do your findings extend? Twitter or also conversations with friends? Yeah, so uh, first of all, the setting of this study is particularly would make it vague. So we don't add anything like 
whether this is going to be a specific individual in your social network, because I'm sure that would be introducing more content and that is sometimes hard to control because, like I said, if you're sharing with your family or your friends, it's going to be very different. Um, that's the one reason we actually keep it vague intentionally because we don't want that to affect people's sharing intention. And also the other thing is uh, if it translates to different social platforms, we actually chose this kind of more close group kind of WhatsApp format of it because we also have participants who are like um, quite old in age and we have participants who are young in age and then the platform they use could probably vary. For example, some of them just not use X in this case. Um, but I think all of all, all people would somehow use any of the, the, the social media app, uh, apps that follow this kind of conversation. You at least can text people and then you can exchange opinion with people. And that's also one of the reasons why we make it in this format. Um, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, initially we aim to make it rather vague rather than making it X, something like that. And also the social network. Um, and the second question um, about the messages, um, that's indeed a good one. And why we we don't include topics in the chat, there, there's another reason about it, because the messages they're, share, they're sharing have different topics. So some of them are of refugee topic and some of them are of climate topic. And um, it would also be kind of weird if they're sharing something about refugee into a group that is specifically talking about climate. So yeah, that's one of the reasons for design as well. All right, that's also about time. <laughs> All time yeah. uh, thanks a lot again to Xinyao and Delaney for sharing their super interesting research projects with us.